I uh, did an interview pretty recently with the new uh, district attorney of Multnomah County, which uh, includes the city of Portland. And uh, there's obviously a lot of crazy stuff going on there. So um, I want to introduce my guest for episode two, Lewis Reed. Um, first, tell me a little bit about yourself, uh, just so the audience can get familiar. And then uh, we'll start with your thoughts on uh, what's going on in Portland and throughout the country. Yeah. So, well, first and foremost, uh, I, I appreciate being on with you. Uh, you know, it's not often that you have uh, someone who has the interest in, in, in the thirst uh, that, that you have, uh, particularly for this subject. So I, I'm appreciative of, you, of your leadership. I'm appreciative of your tweets. Uh, you, you, your tweets wake me up in the morning like how my alarm clock does. <laughs> <laughs> so, so look, my name is Lewis L. Reed. I'm the national organizer for Hashtag Cut 50. Cup 50 is a bipartisan criminal justice initiative of the Dream Corps, uh, co-founded by CNN political commentator and now Reform Alliance CEO Van Jones and also Jessica Jackson. And we have uh, a very uh, distinct mission. We want to be able to reduce the national prison population in half. That's the reason why we were co-founded. That is our chief cornerstone. Uh, over the last three years, we have successfully passed 17 different bills in 20 states, including the Federal First Step Act which is a bipartisan um, piece of legislation to date that has freed more than 13,000 people. And that was signed into law by current president, uh, or I should say current occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, I'm sorry, Black Lives Matter Parkway in Washington, DC, uh, Donald J. Trump. And um, you know, one of the things that I always say is that I got 99 problems with 45, but the First Step Act is definitely ain't one of them. Uh, and the reason why this issue is uh, extremely important to me is because I've served almost 14 years in federal prison. And so I operate from this notion that those who are closest to the problem are also closest to the solution, but often furthest from resources and power. And so, you know, look, I've, I've had people ask me all the time, hey, Lewis, how could you work with an administration that seems to be as abhorrent, that seems to be as repulsive, and quite frankly, that seems to just be as uh, insensitive as the current administration? And I often tell them, look, I have never been incarcerated. I have never seen someone serve, you know, a life sentence. I've never seen someone say that I want to get back home to my family. However, I don't want, I don't want to be released if it happens to come through the, uh, through the pen of a Republican or a Democrat. People who are in the prison house don't care who's in the White House so long as they can get back home to their mama's house. And so um, that's what kind of like one of my, my drivers. Wow, that's really well said. Thank you. Um, and yeah, that's that's definitely, you know, um, interesting. There's a lot of people who say that Trump has actually been better for criminal justice um, than some past Democratic presidents. Um, if that's the case, you know, I haven't done the research and weighed number of things signed. Um, but if that's the case, it has nothing to do with his... Um, political beliefs or his, you know, stance on racial or social justice. Um, you know, I personally think that he acts 100% of the time on what he thinks will best maintain his power and, you know, more, probably more than anything, just public opinion of him. Um, you know, so, but, you know, to your point, it doesn't matter who is in the White House. You know, my right. time, um, you know, meeting with uh, incarcerated people at Greenhaven Prison, um, it was very clear that, you know, what's happening there is very much disconnected from what's happening on the outside. And so one of the, you know, the benefits that I provided to them was this like <clears throat> window into what's even happening, you know, with changing technology. Um, Although, you know, now it's been a number of years now, um, a lot of people do have access. Um, oftentimes, you know, they're taking a risk doing it, but they have access to cell phones and stuff like that. Um, yeah. But obviously what they provided me, um, you know, the understanding and, and knowledge that they gave me was, you know, obviously far greater. Um, you know, it's, it's really for people who have never stepped foot in a prison or never been arrested and, um, you know, 
obviously, you know, in most cases, the treatment of someone who looks like me is going to be a lot better than the treatment of someone who looks like you. Um, but being arrested is not fun, no matter who you are. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, 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 and look, um, I, I think that you are, you know, definitely in, in, in the right, in, in the right neighborhood, when you think about uh, disparities, even in our criminal justice system, how, you know, an individual of color, uh, or, you know, black, brown, or poor white, I should say, uh, when you have those individuals who can commit the same crime, the same crime, right? Um, where I come from in my neighborhood, the Bridgeports of Connecticut, when, you know, you get a, a, a bunch of guys together that very well may be participating in a criminal enterprise, and um, they call that a conspiracy. However, you go to New Haven, Connecticut, where Yale University is, uh, and when you have guys who are participating in the same type of behavior, who happens to have access to affluence, influence, and power, they call that a fraternity. Mm -hmm. And so there's a double standard um, for the application of justice in our American legal system that definitely um, can be changed, should be changed. And I think that we are in the right moment um, to create a movement for that change. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, two great examples are cash bail. Um, you know, there are seven out of 10 people in this country who are in jail have not been convicted of a crime. Um, and then, you know, who are they're there because they can't afford to get out, um, no matter what their offense was. Um, and then another example is, you know, it used to be a hundred times worse, the penalty for crack versus cocaine, you know, and then they fixed it and it's still 20 times, you know. Yeah. Um, so on that note, you know, I, I get a lot of um, hate mail and, and things like that from people on the right and even centrists. Um, and but specifically as it relates to what's going on in our society right now, um, this is the biggest movement we've ever had in this country. Um, people are protesting in all 50 states. And one of the things I hear all the time in this really sarcastic way um, is, you know, I thought this was about George Floyd. What about George Floyd? Um, and they're, they're saying that because they, they don't care about George Floyd, the people saying this. Um, but they are, you know, potentially narrow-minded enough to believe that what's happening right now was always exclusively about George Floyd, or they know that it was the match that lit this fire. Um, and this is just a way to, you know, to kind of sp spread questions about what everyone is doing right now. So um, as someone who works, you know, from within, um, and has been incredibly effective in implementing real substantive change. Um, what do you think the value is of um, protesting on the streets? And, you know, what, what would you say to those, like, what do you think we're protesting for? And, and you know, wh how, what would you say about the response uh, from local police and Trump um, to the protesters? Yeah, so I'll answer the latter first, uh, and I'll give you a quote from MLK. There's nothing as dangerous as sincere ignorance or conscientious stupidity. So, uh, you know, when people kind of like say, uh, this is supposed to be about George Floyd, et cetera, right? Like, I, I'm, I'm not even going to address that. What I will address is this. We need an inside-outside game. Um, for, far too, for far too long, there has been this uh, disjointing of the sort and this kind of like dividing and conquering of, of the movement. You know, the movement says, the movement wants to be pulled in one direction and then you'll have people who can kind of like come in and manipulate uh, the, the, that, that, that course of action where it's going somewhere else. I think what's happening right now is what's supposed to be happening. You have something that's organic, you have something that doesn't look like a reflection of what's going on in another neighborhood. However, everybody is anchored in the same passion. That passion is that we are not concerned about symbols of racism. We are concerned about systems of racism. And so when you look at the George Floyd situation, when you look at Breonna Taylor, when you look at Philando Castillo, when you look at Richard Brooks at Infinitum, what you are seeing is 
people on the surface who are those pundits who say that I thought that it was supposed to be about the George Floyd. Those are the people who are looking at things from a symbolic point of view. The, those of us like you and myself who are in the fight, who are in the streets, who are on, taking the social media, who are mobilizing people to action, we are looking at these systems of racism. And so for us, this is bigger than Nino Brown. This is not necessarily about George Floyd, but this is about the hundreds of thousands of other George Floyds that have been, um, you know, uh, shot down by, you know, an American legal system. This is about the more than 70 million George Floyds who have criminal convictions in this country. This is about the 2.2 million George Floyds who happen to be incarcerated in our prison systems. This is about the more than 7 million George Floyds who are currently under uh, some form of supervision in our, in our communities. This is about the more than 46,000 consequences that uh, the American Bar Association says that uh, there are uh, 46,000 collateral consequences, I should say, that the American Bar Association says comes with one singular felony as a result of the George Floyds having been convicted uh, in our American legal system. So for, for us, this is bigger than Eno Brown. And we don't have time to be distracted by, uh, by outrage. We are con we're concerned about outcomes. So people like you and I, uh, when you have those individuals who are on the right and people who are you know, centrist or you know, it, as far left as Pluto, it doesn't matter. When they, have, when they, when they sit from the comfort from the vantage point of their living room and they have these Twitter fingers and they're saying, oh, I thought it was supposed to be about this and I thought it was supposed to be about that. And they're focused on the outrage. We're focused on the outcomes. And that's where, that's where we show up in our leadership. Our leadership is about the outcomes. How are we gonna take this moment and how are we gonna continue to sustain it into a movement, a movement that is going to be um, a reframing of a new America in the spirit of what the original framers talked about, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal in the eyes of God, and all of us should be in the pursuit of health, life, happiness, and everything in between. So are you a patriot? Uh, I am a black man who is in America trying to figure out what my place is. <laughs> uh -huh. okay. You know, and, and, you know, I think that patriot, I think that patriotism, uh, patriot, patriot, patriotism, um, is, is a very, you know, subjective term and it is, is very relative, right? Like, you know, I don't think that you can, um, you, be a black man in America and be fully sold on old glory. Um, I, I don't think that you can be a, you know, a black person in America and, and, and fully, uh, be wedded to uh, the, the, the principles that this country espouse, how, espouses. However, I do think that you can be black in this country and strive towards recalibrating what the original intent of, of, of what this country was founded on, yeah, right? right. Uh, in terms of, you know, we can, we can be, we can be better. We, we are going to be better than before. And I think that we have this very distinct opportunity um, to be reframers of what that better is going to be in the next normal. Yeah, and so what do you envision um, in this new society? Yeah, so look, I, I, I envision one of, one, of, one of several things. Uh, number one uh, is, is what I call J-Lo. And I'm not talking about, you know, the, the Super Bowl uh, halftime uh, uh, 2020 uh, dance in J-Lo. I'm talking about justice. I'm talking about legislation. And I'm talking about economic opportunity. I envision a United States of America that is full of J-Lo. Justice, effective legislation, and economic opportunity. That's, 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 that's what we're talking about, J-Lo. And so I think that um, I envision, you know, a, 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 a country, a country that is, that is going to be true to what it said on paper. Just be true to what you said in, in, in your own contract. Not what, we, not, what we, not what we ask you to do, right? But just be true to what you said on paper. Right. Be, true, be true to what you said as it relates to, you know, people having access to equality. Equality. Equality in whatever way, shape, or form it comes in, whether it's women in the workforce, whether it's you know uh, uh, people uh, uh, being judged by a jury of their peers, 
whether it's uh, you know LGBTQ uh, uh, rights, et cetera. Be true to what you said on paper. That's so it. How do we how do we do that? Yeah, I think that we do it the way that we're doing it now. We do it the way that we're doing it now. We keep applying pressure. We keep and we refuse. We refuse to take no for an answer. For far too long, we have accepted a maybe. Let's do it in, in another Congress. Let's do it in another presidency. Let's do it, um, you know, in another time. And we have, you know, essentially been punting the ball. And right now, we're saying, look, we're not punting the ball anymore. We are on the field. We are going to play. We are not going to break into a huddle. We are going to execute what needs to be executed so that we can move this down the field. And ultimately, we are going to score a touchdown uh, uh, for our community and for the culture. And do you think um, it's possible to implement enough reforms from the inside to, to, you know, to, to make this work? I th look, anything is possible and not everything is probable. And so I think that, you know, right now the time is right for the probability to happen for the probability to occur. Right. Um, and I don't think, I think that this is a multi-pronged approach. This is not something that you do exclusively through legislation. This is a matter of an internal policy. How do I re-regulate my heart? How do I re-frame uh, uh, my, my, my uh, intellectual policy? How do I, you know, move uh, my company, my organization to action in a way that doesn't necessarily take uh, an act of Congress? Right. This is a matter of the heart. This is a heart issue right now. And this, what we are seeing in our country is a, is, it's a great awakening where people have to look at the reflection of themselves. How, is my how are my principles aligned with what's currently happening? How are my principles aligned with what is going to be happening 5, 10, 20, 30 years from now? How am I leaving a legacy of somebodyness? To, to, to a generation that very well may be coming up, uh, up alongside of me or two steps behind me. So, you know, it sounds like you might be a little more um, optimistic about some of the worst, I, I don't know a better way to put it, some of the worst people in our society. Um, like, I, I feel like, you know, a lot, like 50% almost of this country voted for Trump. Um, and certainly a, pro a portion of them were, will always just vote Republican, which I have a problem with to begin with, because, you know, it's it's two two evils and but the Republicans have been worse since slavery. So, um, you know, so but, you know, and then maybe there's some that are really stupid and voted for him because they like celebrities. But I mean, to me, a lot of them voted for him because he's a white supremacist. And, you know, I, I, I don't see you know, I, I, my, my, like, you know, once I was radicalized very early, um, by an activist mother. And before I realized the power and, and the value and the, you know, the more effectiveness of doing the kinds of work that we do now, I literally just followed in my cousin's footsteps. They, they co-founded skinheads against racial prejudice. And I, I literally just beat up any Nazi I could find, you know, that, doesn't really solve a, a large, it doesn't really solve the problem. It doesn't, it just makes them hate us even more. Um, you know, and, and we're, we're all Jews. So, you know, they already hated us, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. but so, you know, I, now I, I am really, you know, I'm, I, I'm a strong proponent of the work that you do a strong proponent of, you know, more radical outside of, the you know the legislative arena work because i think as you mentioned applying pressure it like if they're terrified they're of people terrified like, me, like me they're going to be more likely to listen to people like you like exactly you know? but what about like but but you're now talking about the heart and things like that like do you think you know how much of how much buy in do we need from this 50% of the country that just hates us because of our blood or our color Look, let me tell you something. Um, I come from the bottom, man, right? Like I, I, come from, I come from the Bridgeports of Connecticut, which is the equivalent of the Compton of California. I'm from Connecticut. Chicago. I, I know. Oh, are you? Yeah. Yeah, right. Like, so, so let's, 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 let's think about this. One of the things that I, I understand is that the people in power is never greater than the power of people. 
Um, I'm unapologetically, you know, Christian, a person of faith. And I, you know, have seen, seen God move in the most mundane and bleak situations. And it's just been my experience that, you know, God call it the universe, call it serendipity, et cetera, but he will always do more with less. And so we don't necessarily need the 50%. We don't need the 60%. We just need a faithful few. And it was a faithful few that radicalized literally an entire world where 2000 plus years ago, we are still talking about Jesus. Even if you disagree with you know, his theology, you have to agree with his philosophy. Uh, and his his humanity, just a faithful few. It took 12 people to radicalize in, an entire world. So you mean to tell me that with the soul force that we have, with the heart force that we have, with the intelligence that we have, with the technology that we have, that we can't take a faithful few and radicalize not just our community, not just our state, not just our region, but we can't radi radicalize an entire nation? Nah, I refuse to believe that. The reason why I refuse to believe that is because I served almost 14 years in federal prison and it was nothing but the power of hope. It was nothing but the power of faith. It was nothing but the power of optimism that sustained me, that kept me buoyant through that. And I saw even in the, you know, the most so-called uh, discardable situation, I saw beauty rise out of ashes. And so I refuse to believe that the people in power or the people in the, in the majority is greater than those who are in the minority. I just, I just refuse to believe it. That's a, yeah, that's a great answer. I agree. I, I don't, I don't think we need them either. Um, and I think they're going to be, you know, it's going to take, they're going to push back like they are right now showing up at protests armed, um, you know, trying to run us over with their cars Um you know, trying to introduce legislation that is the antithesis of what we need. Um, but, you know, we, we have the power in all of those, you know, areas that, that you're talking about. And I, I fully agree. Um, you know, like it was revolutionary to, um, you know, to believe that black people should vote not long ago. Um, and it's really, and, you know, on that note, just as a side note, it's mind blowing to me that people can think that there's no like, you know, re there, there's no lasting repercussions of that. You know, like the civil rights movement was in 1964. You know, that was like a half century ago, like a little bit more than that. So let's 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 think about this. I was born in the late 70s. I am the first generation my generation is the first generation that was born free in this country yeah there you go <laughs> think about th think about that that was just that was just a little right. bit a, a touch over 30 years ago right my mother was born in jim crow right. my, my 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 grandmother was born during the time of the great depression her her mother was born you know at the tail end of slavery i'm the first generation right that was born so called free in this country Yep. And that, and, and they want you to pick yourself up from the bootstraps, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I'll never forget, like, that's such a cliche, but I, I swear I can picture it like it was yesterday when I was um, lobbying New York State Congress for the repeal of the Rockefeller drug laws. That's what one of those state congressmen said to me. And I mean, I, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's not like the only time I've ever heard it, but just in that context, like when we're talking about the, you know, the racial, um, the, the racial racialized application of these laws um, for him to say that, you know, that just blew my mind. I knew we weren't getting through to that one, but we were effective <laughs> in, at the end, you know, it, yeah. We, yeah. we repealed those laws. Um, are you, you know, would you be able to tell me a little bit more about, you know, your time incarcerated and, you know, what, like what your experience was that led you to once you got out, um, kind of take yeah, to, to kind of, yeah to be yeah i i think i don't think that it was something that kind of like led me to um led me to something once i got out i think that i had an epiphany um while i was incarcerated uh that epiphany came through like you know looking at the 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 radical tenets of 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 jesus looking at how um the soul force that he 
really embody uh, change folks and looking at how he was changed from the inside, um, that he was changed from the inside out. And so, you know, I, I think that it was a combination of that. It was a combination of just looking around and seeing too many people who look like me, who came from where I came from, who had the same uh, cultural texture that, that I had, who uh, were excessively prosecuted and disproportionately sentenced. And it lit a righteous indignation in me. And all of us have that moment. You had that moment in your life where you're like, man, nah, I don't know what's, how I'm going to do it. I don't know when I'm going to do it. I don't know, you know, how, if it's going to be structured, if it's going to be organized, if it's going to be uh, unorthodox, et cetera. But I know something has to be done. Something has to be done. And so, um, you know, I just began to like organize even while, when I was incarcerated. I remember, you know, once uh, for, you know, either one or two of the censuses, um, I was, up, I was uh, incarcerated in upstate New York, very white rural area in Raybrook, New York. Of and yeah, I remember when um, the census had came around and they were, you know, telling people, telling us who were incarcerated to fill out the census. And I organized, a, you know, a protest against that. I'm like, why, why would we fill out a census? Why would we allow you guys to capitalize off of our incarceration? Yeah. Think about it. In you addition know, to the, how they already are. Correct. Right. You know, so, you know, for the viewing audience or the listening audience, you, someone may say, well, what does a census has to do with incarceration? I, I'm glad that you asked that question because I'm going to tell you. <laughs> if you look, if, you, if, if, if a person fills out a census, it doesn't say, are you currently incarcerated as you fill this out? That municipality gets credit for they get it gets racial credit it gets gender credit it gets all types of credit that ultimately is going to um, convert and translate itself into federal funding dollars and so you know we had already been exploited right through prison labor we're already exploited through the amount of time that we got we weren't going to be exploited anymore so you know i would i would you know uh, lead protests uh, in that regard i remember you know when they used to raise the commissary prices the commissary prices is the equivalent of us going to our local super walmart when you're incarcerated and you you buy your groceries they would inflate uh, commissary prices but they didn't they didn't uh, give us a a so called uh, uh, a cost of living increase, right? Right, right? And so, you know, I would leave boycotts there. And I just said to myself, like, look, man, I'm going to continue to, you know, tap into my 1989 uh, uh, do the right thing, Radio Raheem, fight the power. And, you know, I just refused to, I refused to forget about the people that I was once incarcerated with. Did you have, were there any repercussions? Um, oh, yeah, without question. Yeah, yeah, without question. You know, they would put me in, in solitary confinement under so-called investigation. My last four months of incarceration, I was actually uh, released from, incar um, from solitary confinement. So, yeah, without question. Um, you know, anytime you, anytime you um, so-called, you know, mass organize while you are incarcerated, you are going to be, you know, exposed to those consequences and those penalties. But yo, look at this at the time, you know, it was it was for the movement, it was for the culture, and ultimately, you know, things things did change.